<coughs> well, thank you very much, Karin. Uh, I hope you can hear me at the back. If not, you let me know. I'll speak louder. Uh, subject to my cough. I have a little cough. <laughs> Hopefully that won't interfere. It's really great to be back in Utrecht. I hope this won't be my last act. It's the last act of this visit, apart from drinking and eating, but I hope, and sleeping, but I hope it won't be my last time in Utrecht, for sure. I really enjoy being here. And thank you to you, Karen, to Jose, to uh, Mirko, mm -hmm. and to William for a great hospitality while I've been here. It's been excellent. So, I'm a social theorist uh, interested in media. And in this lecture, I want to ask an apparently simple question. What is going on with data in society today? And the answer to that question is there in the rest of my title, the terms social order and data colonialism, which I'll unpack through my talk. But as a way of justifying my subtitle, I want to address specifically the meta question of whether social theory can help us understand what is going on with data today in society. And if so, what sort of social theory do we need? The talk will try to provide a bridge between my last book, The Mediated Construction of Reality, from 2016, written with Andreas Hepp, which developed the concept of social order, drawing particularly on Norbert Elias, and my forthcoming book, which Karen's mentioned, The Costs of Connection, uh, written with Ulysses Machias, which comes out this August. And if you like my talk, you can order it 30% off using uh -huh. the postcard conveniently provided for you at the back and the front. And the time for a full launch of that new book will be in the future with Ulysses here too. But what I want to do today is to offer you a preview of that new argument but in a way that foregrounds the continuities between the two books. Taken together, the, books, the two books offer the best answer that I'm capable of to the question why we need social theory today and what sort of social theory is it that we need. A core principle of social theory is that human beings, in some sense, construct their reality through their interactions, they make their reality social. But there are many people who are asking today, do human beings still construct their social reality? And one reason they ask is because of concerns today that human life itself is being re-engineered, not by humans directly, but through data, artificial intelligence, machine learning. This specific concern about human beings' relations to artificial intelligence builds on earlier concerns that the design of IT systems conflicts with human values. What if the values embedded in and driving IT and computing systems are increasingly diverging from human values? Some designers even argue that they must diverge. Because if human beings interfere in complex computing systems, they would damage them. We would mess things up, so we must keep out of it. Mansell calls this, my colleague Robin Mansell from LSE, the problem of complexity in IT and system design. But if technological systems are too complex for members of society to intervene in, there is a problem for society and therefore for social theory. Surely, if we are to understand the, ro the world of which we are part, we need some theory that can help us ask questions about the role of huge information systems in how societies fit together. But that's where today's social science, operating in the face of increasingly dominant discourses around big data, and big data's potential for transforming human knowledge, that's where social science runs into a problem, indeed its own problem of complexity. Let's step back a minute. In the 1950s, the era of American sociologist Talcott Parsons, the work of social theory seemed very clear. It seemed to be to map how societies hold together by finding the connections between social values, 
and the social institutions that humans build on the basis of those values. That was a functionalist model of how societies hold together as societies. But those models really don't help us today. When we think about how contemporary societies hold together, we think of our global infrastructures of connection, the internet, the economic and social processes built around it. We think of what one US writer has called the stack. And the first thing we think of in relation to those infrastructures is complexity. They're vast. They operate on many levels in highly technical ways, far beyond the ability of most people to understand or even describe. And that creates a risk for social science. The risk is that our most advanced work will concentrate simply on describing that infrastructure, the apps, the platforms, the software, the hardware, the cloud that stores it all. Social science and particularly communications research is perhaps, as American journalism scholar Rob Benson put it, going through a new descriptivist era. But to state the obvious, description is not criticism. It's not evaluation. We have to do better than that. But what theoretical concepts can help us towards more critical analysis? Well, we could think of power and attempt to understand the power of platforms, their relation to economic power, their relation to state power. That will be important. But it's very hard to understand contemporary change just by studying business models and platform design. Since that doesn't tell us how what platforms do connects with the role that we as human beings play in the organization of everyday life. Or we could think of identity, our projects as individuals to make sense of the world, to find agency. But this is not enough unless we also understand how individuals' possibilities for action are today being shaped by the landscapes that digital platforms are building. We need concepts that help us grasp the relation between large-scale platform power and the lives of individuals. The founders of the internet said that this relation will be one of freedom, that the internet would empower individuals. If you look, for example, at Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen's book, The New Digital Age, written just six years ago in 2013, that's the message you get. But six years later, that today, that story of freedom seems far too simple. So perhaps then we need a different type of concept. A concept that thinks about complexity in a different way. And one way to find this is to return to the work of a social theorist who has been neglected in recent years in the UK and US, I'm ashamed to say, but not here in Holland, the German sociologist Norbert Elias. Elias was deeply opposed to the functionalist models of society and social order that were developed in America, for example, by Talcott Parsons. Elias instead was interested in human relations, and in particular the relations of interdependence between people and institutions that become ever more important as societies grow more complex. For Elias, Instead of thinking about power as something outside and above relationships, he wrote quotes that power is an attribute of relationships, which means that any order that does emerge in society emerges through relationships, through how relationships, more precisely, are organized. Indeed, understanding the interdependencies that characterize societies may be the best route into understanding those societies' complexities and their dynamics of power and inequality. Now, Elias, as you know, applied this approach to many long-term developments from sport to the medieval system of government to habits of eating. Crucial to Elias's approach was the notion of social order and how it emerges as a form of, if you like, force from increasingly intense patterns of interdependence. Let's look a little more at how Elias explained his approach to social order. 
And by the way, if it seems, even in Holland, a little strange to return today to a social theorist working 40 years ago or more, remember that Elias introduced his approach to social order as a way of changing completely and forever the social sciences' ways of speaking and thinking. Society's older language, Elias said, explains social order in terms of things, such as norms and values, structure, society itself, the individual, rather than, as Elias argued we should, in terms of processes, the processes through which something like order emerges, and at certain points in history, new types of order emerge. <coughs> Now Elias was particularly interested, and here of course he deeply influenced Foucault amongst others, Elias was interested not in power or identity in the abstract, but in processes of social interweaving. Why? Because of, as he puts it, the special kind of order associated with them, which means starting with the connections, the relationships, and working out from there to the elements, such as individual people, involved in them. And then to the order that is made. Now this way of thinking about order, building from the relationships, sounds rather Foucauldian, even Latourian. So it's worth emphasizing that although I'm quoting here from Elias's last works in the 70s, he'd already developed the core of this approach in the 1930s in the work that led to the first edition of The Civilizing Process, published in exile in 1942. In a sense, he's 40 years ahead of Latour. It's important to remember that, I think. Elias went further, and he offered a deeply material and non-functionalist understanding of what social order is. As he writes, the behavior of many separate people intermeshes to form interwoven structures. And this term, intermeshing, means that, as in a wire fence, each person in a figuration is pulling on everyone else, trying to get what they want, and through this pulling, a structure is created. The order that emerges, in other words, only emerges because they pull. In other words, because they care. In other words, because meaning is at stake in the network relations between people. Elias's concept for developing this was the figuration. I don't have time to get into its details today. There's a lot about it in my previous book with Andreas Hepp. And it underlies the concept of order that's critical to the new book with Ulysses Mejias. One of Elias's classic examples of the figuration was the anxiety of the medieval courtier. The new time structure that began to emerge as people around the royal courts of Europe started to try to coordinate many types of actions together because the emerging understanding of government required this. No one designed that pressure as such, but an order emerged through the pull of countless interrelations with wholly new consequences for the feel of human action and the force that could be applied by powerful individuals, such as kings, on less powerful ones. So what briefly are the advantages of Elias's emphasis on an understanding of social order? Well, first, that it takes account of technological complexity, the many levels of pressure and interdependence that make up a social order, including, for example, today's social orders, which result from our dependence on large-scale systems of connection and information flow based on computers. The second advantage is that the concept of figuration takes seriously the position of human beings in this order. So it foregrounds the perspective of humans entangled in this complexity. Or more simply, the questions of meaning that arise for human beings as they try to live their lives within this order. So Elias grasps that the social world is always both full of meaning and it's built like an environment. It's double in nature, always, as the American social theorist William Sewell put it. It's never either meaning 
or infrastructure. It's always both meaning and infrastructure, inseparably. Elias's approach, therefore, solves the problem that I mentioned before of descriptivism. The problem of focusing only on describing the technical infrastructure and ignoring the human beings entangled within it. Even more remarkable, Elias anticipated 40 years ago exactly our problem today of descriptivism, when towards the end of his last book, he reflected on the ethics of social research. And he wrote that people often seem deliberately to forget that social developments have to do with changes in human interdependence. If no consideration is given to what happens to people in the course of social change, changes in figurations composed of people, then any scientific effort might as well be spared. There's no point in social science if we miss the human entanglement. This is a deeply moral approach to the techno-social complexity of the world. There's much more I could say about Elias's approach to social order, how we can build on it to understand higher levels of complexity. That's all in my last book, The Mediated Construction of Reality. But now, on that foundation, I want to get to my main topic today, which is how, in the spirit of Elias, but drawing on another number of other types of theory, we can start to answer the question from which I started. What is going on with data today? And specifically, what is going on in society? That is from the perspective of social order and human beings when we think about data. Answering this question requires some further steps in critical theory that can address the following features of our digital world. The increasing dependence by human beings, all of us, on the social infrastructure that digital platforms provide which in turn generates the increasing intersection of social processes with economic processes. When, to put it in its most crude, the very places where we hang out to be with our closest friends are themselves built for the extraction of profit. An era when new forms of corporate power, platforms, corporations that have a lot of data are entering into radically new relations to state power, governments that now have much less data. And an era when the extraction of economic value from human life through data relations is everywhere. Human relations, data relations are constructed so that data can be extracted from them, which of course operates through the means of continuous surveillance and the influencing of human life by corporations so as to generate more data. And cutting across all of this, something I'll bring out, there are disputes about how all of this should be regulated and interpreted by law, by which I mean, of course, the European GDPR, but also the software architectures that make, in a sense, regulate the continuous collection of data. So those are the basic starting points, I think, for any analysis today. <coughs> Here, by the way, is a little more information on the book. As I said, there are also leaflets, and there's my uh, co-author from Mexico, now living in the States, Ulysses Mejias. Now, let me tell you what our main point is in this book. It is that what's happening today in digital societies, where data harvesting seems such a natural, such a basic feature of everyday life, is not just, as many writers have claimed, a development of capitalism, or even a new phase of capitalism. It's something even bigger. It is, we suggest, a genuinely new phase of colonialism that will in time provide the fuel for a later stage of capitalism whose full shape we cannot predict yet. And this is what we start to see if we shift the time scale from the past 30 to 40 years, when for sure capitalism has become embedded in ever more sectors of daily life, to the past 500 years, over which the relations of capitalism to colonialism have played out. Now that means thinking about colonialism, not so much in terms of its terrible violence or its racism, two key tools that historic colonialism used 
to impose its order, but instead in terms of colonialism's underlying historic role. And by this we mean the appropriation of resources on a vast scale. In 1500 and for the next 500 years, talking simply, it was the territory, it was territory that was appropriated. It was the resources of the land and of course the bodies, for a long time those of slaves, needed to extract value from those resources. Today the resource being appropriated by a new colonialism is very simple. It's us. Human life, in all its depth and variety, extracted its value through the medium of data. This possibility that we're entering a genuinely new phase of colonialism where human beings are the target is the bad news. But there's also some good news. First, that this cycle of colonialism is only just starting, by just I mean in the past 20 years or so. So we have perhaps the chance to resist it. Second, that today we have a memory of what historic colonialism did and how over centuries it fueled industrial capitalism. And in today's debates, we should probably listen to those whose memory of colonialism's impact is sharper than ours. And third, we certainly know, all of us, what capitalism is, having lived much or all of our lives under it. The initial victims of historic colonialism did not have those last two advantages. Now, to give you a sense of what we might gain by interpreting what's happening with data on this longer timescale, let's think back to last year and a key moment in everyone's realisation that something big is going on with data. I mean the Cambridge, uh, sorry, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, which broke out in mid-March 2018. I'm sure I don't need to explain, I couldn't if you want, but I'm sure it's familiar to all or almost all of you. This scandal prompted many people to start checking what data was routinely being collected about them via platforms such as Facebook, search engines such as Google, by the many apps that link to Facebook and so on. Many people were shocked, although many already understood this. And as the scandal grew, Christopher Wiley, who was a former employee of Cambridge Analytica and was the Edward Snowden of this scandal, commented on Twitter on Cambridge Analytica's plans for expanding its operations of political influence to India. This is what modern colonialism looks like, he wrote. But you might say, that's too easy a comparison to make. Yes, the legacy of older colonialism lives on in the geography of global capitalism, in the dominant power to this day of American culture, in the racial divides in America, Brazil, many other countries, almost every power of, every form of power imbalance today can in some way be related back to the legacy of historic colonialism. And the sort of power that Facebook has sought to exercise, for example, in Africa, through its Facebook Free Basics platform, surely is best understood as a neo-colonial move, benefiting from the historic imbalance between the African and American economies. But surely you might say, that doesn't mean that what's going on with data today is a new type of colonialism. And you will be right, it's too easy to use the word colonialism as a metaphor. But Ulysses and I, when we talk about data colonialism, we don't mean it as a metaphor. We're claiming instead that what is going on with data today represents potentially as far-reaching an appropriation of resource as the conquest of gold and land in historic colonialism. A capture of digital territory that is likely to have as huge implications as historic colonialism once did. A new colonial reality, not a metaphor, which we must grasp. Think of the terms of service that we sign up to every time we install an app every time we join a platform. In normal times, no one reads them. We just click accept. Because we want to get on, use the app or the platform. Sometimes we're under pressure to do this. Perhaps our employer encourages us to use a Fitbit or Apple Watch to monitor our health. 
which requires us to accept that device's terms and conditions, whether we like them or not. Or we may be required to accept terms and conditions of data extraction by an insurer, or by the supplier of a smart appliance in our home, such as a fridge or a washing machine, assuming we want the insurance or the appliance to work for us. But by that act of acceptance, actual or implied, we enter into a whole set of data relations that enfold in ways we only very partly understand. Going back for a moment to the language of my book with Andreas Hepp, these data relations are an important contemporary example of figurations, the concept I introduced earlier from Elias. So social theory, including the concept of figuration, can help us understand the consequences of entering into data relations. And yet, it is not enough to explain why we enter into data relations. This is where the perspective, the historical perspective of colonialism is important. Let's think back to a document used in the early days of the Spanish conquest of Latin America called the Requerimiento, or Demand. Almost exactly 500 years ago, because the document was drafted in 1513 at the Spanish court, conquistadors would ride on horseback to one, of, one or two miles outside a village whose gold they wanted. And they would read out this document in the middle of the night in Spanish, a language they knew the, la the locals could not understand. Here's a little of it. If you do not submit, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your country and we shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and of their highnesses. We shall take away your goods and shall do you all the mischief and damage that we can. The next morning, having read this to themselves, they will ride into the village and take the gold that they wanted using whatever violence they needed to do so, and usually much more. Now you'll notice immediately a difference from our relation to apps and data today. Today, we really do click accept. So no violence is needed to take our gold as we use the platform or app whose terms are presented to us. I'll return to why no violence in a moment. But first let's recall the key features of historic colonialism and try to map them more precisely onto data colonialism today. The, <coughs> the fundamental moves of original colonialism, in our view, can be understood in terms of four levels. The appropriation of resources, the creation of new social relations to stabilise that appropriation, then the extreme concentration of wealth that flows from this enormous new appropriation. And finally, the big stories or the ideologies that are used to give an a different account of what is going on. Most notoriously, the ideology of civilization. <coughs> we see exactly these same four levels at work in data colonialism. First, there is the appropriation of resources, human life itself. Human experience and action become a direct input to capital. We're often told this in the form of a cliché. No one can disagree with a cliché. We're told that data is just human exhaust, something we just give off, so it's just there to be taken, which conveniently forgets the mechanisms needed to gather, format, extract, aggregate and process this supposedly natural resource. Second, social relations are being colonized by data processes. As social relations increasingly take the form of data relations that maximize data extraction for economic value. Developing Karl Marx, we suggest in our book that these new data relations will in time become as important for the sustaining of capitalism as labor relations. Third, the economic value that's extracted is hugely concentrated in the vast wealth of the new colonial corporations, what Ulysses and I call the social quantification sector. Facebook, Google, 
and many more. And finally, there are new colonial ideologies that seek to disguise what's going on. The idea that we must always stay connected. That everything must be put into data form, datafication. So, of course, that we can get more personalised messages and products. And finally, the idea that all of this, including the tracking of us, used to be unfashionable surveillance, is somehow inevitable. A way to advance the future of humanity, even a necessary step towards humanity's greater self-knowledge and a new stage of civilization. So we can see all four dimensions of historic colonialism at work in our life with data today. But there is at least one crucial difference. Unlike in 1500, when colonialism emerged without the background of two or three centuries of capitalism, today's new colonialism builds on top of the already existing social order of capitalism. That's why data colonialism does not generally need violence to be effective. It can instead rely on key changes being introduced today into industrial collapse capitalism social order. Until recently, that was based exclusively on labour relations, the work contract, and our deep relations to commodities which make our labour relations seem natural. But Marx's theory of capitalism as a social order, we believe, allowed the possibility, and here we draw on the reading of Marx by Moshe Postone, it allowed the possibility that at some time in the future, Capitalism might be built on other forms of abstraction than labour relations. Perhaps the same data relations that, as I just explained, we already enter into every day of our lives. So the most important thing going on with data today is perhaps so big that it's really invisible, unless we look at it from the perspective of social theory. At the heart of data colonialism today, Ulysses and I propose, is a new corporate strategy, a new colonial co commercial dream. The dream is to annex to capital every point in space and time. Through this to reproduce, if you like, to clone social relations on digital platforms and elsewhere so that this annexation to capital just seems natural just seems inevitable, and through this to build a social order that capitalizes human life without limit. Data colonialism, the new order of social life in the digital age, means the annexation of human life, our lives, to the forces of capital. A capture of resources on a scale with only one precedent in human history, which is the emergence of original colonialism. So let me try and summarise what we might gain from thinking about what's happening with data in society in this way. That is, from the point of view, not just of economic power and market institutions, of capitalism in other words, but also from the perspective, and I stress also, it's not, we're not saying this is not about capitalism, of course it's about capitalism, but also adding in the perspective of a new type of colonialism. Some reasons for this have to do with how a colonial framing helps us see the sheer size of what's going on. So first, a colonial perspective captures well the huge scope of change that our relations with data represent. A reorganisation of human life, from social media to data broking, to workplace surveillance, to new marketplaces like Uber and Airbnb, to internal business processing of data focused by the likes of IBM, Microsoft. Second, a colonial perspective helps us see what is happening with data over a long time scale, as indeed Norbert Elias' work aimed to do. The time frame of not just the past 40 years, but the past 500 years, during which the relations between capitalism and colonialism have been evolving. If we interpret big data without the perspective of colonialism, we miss the long-term roots of today's data extraction in the centuries of colonial rule. We may also miss the role played by the gradual building of the internet, 
and the emergence over the past 40 years of new forms of data management, including logistics, much of it nothing to do with social media at all. And we certainly miss the implications of today's transformations for the long-term future of capitalism. Third, in thinking on this longer historical basis, we have to recognize some differences between the new colonialism and the older colonialism. Differences which have to do with geographical scale. So what's happening with data today is going on not just within the West, but also within the West's main rival for global power, China. This new colonialism therefore has two global poles. It will be a process that has profound effects on global power relations between the very rich countries where control over the IT infrastructure is based, especially America, China, maybe India, on the one hand, and on the other hand, those countries that will become net data sources. But this colonialism is also as much internal as it is external, because it operates on colonialism's home populations too, in America, China, UK, Holland, and elsewhere. A colonial perspective also helps us think differently about the type of transformation that is going on, not just its spatial or temporal scope. So a colonial frame requires us to think about the impacts of data practices on human beings, on human subjects, on their conditions of life, and on the terms of power to which they are forced to submit. A colonial perspective helps us see the damage done to human freedom by the continuous surveillance and tracking that is required to generate the data that capitalism now needs as its fuel. This new colonialism does not certainly involve the degrees of extreme physical violence that historic colonialism did, nor of course does it involve the slavery that became such a key tool of historic colonialism. But as we argue, this extreme physical violence is not necessary now to draw people into relations of effective subjection. That is, data relations which treat their lives as raw inputs to capital and to the extraction of economic value. This new social order derives from relations of interdependence, which, as Elias saw, generate new forms of dependence and rule, predicated, of course, on emerging structures of law. I'm not therefore denying that there is something violent about the emerging social order of data colonialism. Law itself has been understood by some legal theorists, most famously Robert Cover in the United States, as involving the strategic organization of force and violence. And as Wendy Chun notes, discussing the computer code which underlies all platforms, code is executable because it embodies the power of the executive, the power of enforcement that has traditionally been the provenance of government. Many institutions and domains that should have been there before, sorry. Many institutions and domains of life, from insurance to the workplace, health to education, fashion shopping to sport, mainstream politics to social activism, all of them are domains where human beings are increasingly becoming forced through convention, software and law to take on the role of data providers. In addition, the continuous tracking of life that data colonialism involves interferes not just with our freedoms to do particular things, depending on the judgments made of us, let's say, by algorithms, but it interferes with something more fundamental. It interferes with the space of the self that is the very basis of freedom. What Hegel called the freedom to be with oneself, by self, without external interference. Data colonialism, its practices of continuous tracking, as well as the discriminations and judgments such tracking makes possible, represents therefore a challenge to the fundamental rights of humanity, just as historic colonialism did. There's much more I could say on the topic of freedom and autonomy, but I want to move on to one further reason why our relations to data must be understood within a colonial framework.
And that is because they represent a true continuation of the colonial relationship to knowledge that was so fundamental to historic colonialism. What was once the West's goal of imposing one single model of knowledge and rationality on the world is now the goal of data colonialism's rival powers, America and China. The values which shape the uses of data knowledge in these two countries appear on the surface to be very different, but they converge around something fundamental. The idea that knowledge must be generated through artificial intelligence and the mining of data, not by other means, an idea which has deep continuity with the colonial projects of the past. Let me say a little more about this last point because it's absolutely crucial and very relevant to law, as we'll see. There has been a debate for a long time about the need to interpret capitalism not in isolation, but in terms of its longer emergence out of colonialism. Ulysses and my proposal to think of what's happening with data in terms of colonialism, not just in terms of capitalism's development, is very much part of that line of thinking. But an important part particularly of decolonial thinkers' responses to this long-term history of colonialism and capitalism involves challenging our understanding not just of capitalism, but of modernity too, and the distinctive understanding of rationality embedded within our inherited understandings of modernity in the West. For the late Aníbal Quijano, a leading Peruvian sociologist, what was wrong at, at base with the vision of rationality that fueled both modernity and colonialism was not rationality as such. This is not a postmodern view saying rationality is bad, which is ridiculous. It was not even the idea of totality, which he argues every notion of rationality has to involve. No, he argued, the problem was the particular Western conception of rationality and totality. Here is Quijano, it's a marvellous quote, so I'll read it in full. He writes, writing in 1992 originally, translated in 2007, that outside the West, virtually in all known cultures, all systematic production of knowledge is associated with a perspective of totality. But in those cultures, the perspective of totality in knowledge includes the acknowledgement of the heterogeneity of all reality, of the irreducible contradictory character of the latter, of the legitimacy, the desirability of the diverse character, of the components of all reality, and therefore of the social. The better idea of social totality, he argues then, not only does not deny it depends on the historical diversity and heterogeneity of society, of every society. In other words, it not only does not deny, it requires the idea of an other, diverse, different. I think it's hard to think of a better summing up than this, of the interpretative violence that is at the heart of the ideology of dataism, as Joseph N. Dyke called it in a marvellous article from 2014. But remember, these are the reflections, not about data, of a decolonial thinker who was looking back on the reality, not just of capitalism or even modernity, but on the reality of colonialism's inextricable involvement in, indeed, preconditioning of both capitalism and modernity. Let me add one more perspective on this. The controversial German legal and political theorist Carl Schmitt, who I have never referred to in my work until now, for obvious reasons, helps us in the realm of law to develop this disturbing connection even further. Schmitt, in his book, The Nomos of the Earth, offered the most clear-sighted account by anyone of the relation within historic colonialism between law and the appropriation of territory and natural resources. Schmidt was looking back on an older colonial order in the wake of Germany's catastrophic defeat in World War II. For Schmidt, controversially, 
The very idea of law, nomos, is based on the seizure of land. That idea may, of course, not be accepted. But what's important today is Schmidt's reading of the historic intertwining of colonialism, rationality, and law. Schmidt was interested in the period in the early 16th century when an older medieval Christian world order was fading and the new legal order of global modernity was emerging alongside and as part of historical colonialism. According to Schmidt, what enabled a new international legal order to be built was the discovery of, quotes, previously unknown oceans, islands, and territories. For Schmidt, the colonial appropriation of resources was essentially outside the law, lawless. But through its act of force, it created the basis of a new order of law. Even more interesting is how Schmidt argued that this act of force was justified at the time and in his view retrospectively. For Schmidt, the conqueror's scientific cartographic survey was a true title, legal title, to a terra incognita because it embodied a superior rationality generating, he says, a completely different type of legal title, effective occupation. But Schmidt goes on and takes this even further. European discovery, he writes, of a new world in the 15th and 16th centuries thus did not occur by chance. It was an achievement of newly awakened Occidental rationalism. The Indians lacked the scientific power of Christian European rationality. The intellectual advantage was entirely on the European side, so much so that the new world could simply be taken. So there is Schmidt reflecting on the order of international law in modernity, on which we've all relied in many parts of our lives, I suppose, and basing it on a hierarchical claim to the West's superior hold on rationality. Fast forward to today, and my point is not about Schmidt as such, fast forward to today, and we have writers such as West Coast, US West Coast evangelist Kevin Kelly, arguing that the momentum of technology underlying dataism is inevitable, and humanity's self-knowledge depends on the continuous tracking of human subjects everywhere and at all times. And we also, of course, have a struggle, which you're, many of you are involved in, between legal systems to define the order that will authorize more or less this transformation. Meanwhile, a social world is being built on the assumption of our acceptance of data relations an intermeshing of many relations in an order which will change the nature of power and the direction of history. So to conclude, the new social order of datification which I've described needs critical theory. We need not only theories of capitalism but theories of colonialism. We need concepts that grasp technological and social complexity but from the perspective of the order that emerges from our interactions as human beings with those infrastructures. The consequences, in other words, of this emerging order for human beings. And that is pushing us towards a new convergence of critical theory. We need Elias, certainly, but also Marx, who wrote, as I discovered interestingly recently, who wrote that communication and information are dialectical instances of the same social activity, the social construction of reality. We need the materialist phenomenology that Andreas Hepp and I propose in our book, but also decolonial theories that grasp today's battles for data justice as battles in part for cognitive justice. Justice over the terms of knowledge and information. We need nothing less than this if we are to grasp the conflicted world of digital platforms and big data and our parts in it. This is a project where I think the work of social theory will converge with the struggles of critical data scientists, legal theorists, and citizens too. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Nick. I think that was a wonderful, enlightening speech. Um, I think we will now continue. Uh, yeah, should we use the microphone? Yes, I think we will have to, for the recording.
Um, so, great value in this idea of data being some kind of natural resources to my mind. And I also can see um, the value of using um, a notion or a concept such as that of uh, colonialism as, um, thank you, um, as a way to, uh, to make sense of all that we can see happen in these modern times. So let me just accept those very powerful theories for a minute and, and reflect on this notion of data colonialism from my own perspective, uh, which is that of a constitutional lawyer working in this field of fundamental rights law. And from that perspective, I think it is that one of the historic that state dominate, exploit, able. And it logically follows from that, that uh, law, in particular international law, focuses on states as main actors. So if any human rights violations occur, for instance, um, it is only the state that can be held responsible for that. Well, to a certain degree, international law has been modernized to the extent that states can be held accountable for exploitation or uh, misuse of resources that is indirect state action. So perhaps in China, the state may still dominate um, the companies that exploit platforms. And to the extent that that is the case, it might be possible to use international trade law or international human rights treaties to bring a case against the Chinese state for the way in which it has allowed the state held And indeed, that would fit this metaphor of uh, colonialism really well, because um, this is a concept that international law knows and uses, and it still fits our historical understanding that states are crucial actors um, in this regard. But what I think important is that this may only help in cases where strong uh, companies are indeed strongly connected to the state. But in particular, in Europe, as well as in the United States, the role of states is strongly decreasing if compared to the role of private parties. So in many states, platforms are really and fully exploited by large companies, and they thus escape the traditional notions of state action and state responsibility. And in fact, law is struggling with that new reality where the power of private companies is sometimes just as big or even bigger than that of states. So for me, the question actually is, if this concept of data colonialism could help us protect human rights and rule of law values in relation to this new private party dominated reality. And I'm not really sure about that. In fact, what came to my mind when I was reading Nick Coulter's work and listening him to, to him today, um, is that it is perhaps more useful to rely on a number of connected notions, which he also has explained, and which are closely connected to colonialism. So Nick Coultry often speaks in terms of exploitation, of extraction, of appropriation of resources. And that is something that we also know well in the physical world, in the realm of law. We all know how companies establish factories in Bangladesh or in Pakistan to produce very cheap products there. We know how oil companies show their presence in Nigeria and other African states to exploit natural resources without paying too much notion to labour conditions or to sustainability issues. We also know how companies go about in buying land and exploiting mines in Africa, increasingly also in northern areas such as Greenland. So what these companies do is exploit and appropriate. That is the type of notions that we as lawyers know and that we can more or less respond to. So there are currently some important court cases holding private companies uh, responsible for the human rights violation that occur outside state borders. There are the rugby principles on businesses and human rights. There are even negotiations ongoing on a new international treaty on the responsibility of companies for their actions. So, in fact, um, I would be happy to embrace this theory of data colonialism and the social reality that Nick Coulter uh, paints in his work. But I would suggest that, in the end, from a legal perspective, it might be useful to not so much use this notion of data colonialism as such, 
but to speak of these notions such as exploitation and appropriation of resources. Probably for me, as well as for other lawyers, those would fit better with our current legal thinking. And um, in the idea of the fact that these non-state actors are now the ones dominating the world globally. And that indeed would be my question or input for the debate that we could have currently today. So is data colonialism really the term that we should use and we should speak about, or should we rather use other connected terms like exploitation and data appropriation? Thank you. It's also slightly intimidating to offer this response uh, to th this response as a, uh, you were also my former mentor during my time at LSE, so it's uh, interesting to shift mm -hmm. positions here. Take care. <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay, so you're, you propose to critically uh, diagnose uh, the impact of big data or the social quantification sector uh, on our contemporary social order through the prism of the history uh, of colonialism. And for this purpose, you develop the concept data relations, uh, which we've also heard about here in, in the, during the lecture, new types of human relations, which enable uh, the extraction of data for commodification. And I, I also agree there's strong potential to draw out these hin historical genealogies to seeing data as a contemporary form uh, of research extraction. However, I have three remarks, which I hope you want to engage with. Uh, me here today. Uh, and during the lecture we heard that you propose that data colonialism works both externally, so on a global scale, akin to the colonial European imperial expansion at the center vis-a-vis -vis territories, for example, in the global south. Here we, for example, can think of recent uh, big tech initiatives to tap into the next frontiers, uh, such as Facebook's search for new territories and users uh, through dronified connectivity in rural Africa, uh, Google's Loon initiative launching balloons for uh, connectivity to serve uh, disconnected communities around the world. Uh, I think this is a very strong uh, continuation, but you also mark a distinct break. So how data colonialism works and internally also uh, operates on its own home uh, populations, where Western companies are exploiting data users, uh, the data uh, that users volunteer as a form uh, of extraction. So my question here, my first question concerns exactly this dialectic between what people, uh, what we can perhaps we describe as internal uh, forms of neo-colonialism and external neo-colonialism. How does this dialectic draw on colonial distinctions between center and periphery? Uh, how do we avoid uh, downplaying or erasing one of the central tenets of colonialism, which is the denigration and also dehumanization of certain populations at the benefit of others. So the, the question of hierarchy and question of power. Uh, as for example, Edward Said, the post-colonial theorist, has demonstrated through forms of science, uh, arts, <coughs> and knowledge production, European colonizers created a distinction between us and them, between center and, and periphery, justifying the need for intervention and rationalizing, which I also hinted at in the, in the lecture, the exploitation of lesser on uncivilized or barbarian groups. In the words of the post-colonial and, and uh, cultural studies scholar Ella Shohat, colonialism just constructs a disciplining, disciplining gaze, subordinating some populations to the powers of superiors. So what becomes of this question of hierarchy uh, in, uh, in forms of data colonialism? And I particularly think, uh, began to think about this dynamic uh, and this process uh, when also reflecting on, uh, on the, your assertion that uh, we are witnessing an emerging or changing social order, uh, as I think it's also interesting to look at the predecessors of this emerging order, uh, which I'm coming across in my work uh, on uh, forced migration uh, and refugees and how they are processed through uh, data infrastructures at the, at the very moment. For example, in Syria, in, in many uh, refugee camps as well as in urban settings, Refugees are forced uh, to uh, hand over their biometrics, which are fingerprints, but also having their irises scanned in order to assist services, to, to, to become processed, recognized in the system. They have no uh, choice but to opt in. For example, if you live in Zatari, uh, where 100,000 refugees live, you can only pay by having your irises scanned. 
Uh, and that was interesting uh, to contrast how this is also a form of data colonialism, which is perhaps less uh, uh, with consent. So there is no way to consent, there is no way to click, even though connectivity now is inevitable. Uh, and we cannot uh, but oblige uh, to consent to terms of services. What happens in situations when there is no terms of services? We, and I think a lot of new tech innovations really uh, draw on uh, or exploit vulnerable groups who have no chance but to opt in or opt out. Um, finally, uh, I want to ask also the question, which is a key debate within post-colonial studies uh, for some time, uh, drawing on the uh, theorist Gayatri Spivak, who explores in her work uh, on rural women in India, the question of how they make do with situation of colonialism, uh, but also uh, patriarchy, whether there's a possibility to speak back. So can the subaltern speak? How can subaltern, uh, 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 or how can we as being dominated in this system of uh, colonialism speak back? For example, in the context of refugees, we've seen examples of people trying to escape uh, from having their fingerprints uh, uh, taken by gluing and burning their fingerprints, but what are uh, more contemporary uh, uh, and, and mainstream forms of resistance, if there are any? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor Coldry. That was very thought-provoking. What you didn't... Um, um, focus so much on here, but uh, in your paper is that you called for resistance and a uh, type of um, revolution. And I like that idea um, because I largely agree with um, that we have a big problem. There's um, uh, too much power flowing to uh, platforms such as Google and Facebook um, uh, for years already. Now on so in the mainstream press, we've been discussing that uh, that comes with privacy problems. Um, more and more scholars for a few years already and also mainstream press is starting to pick up um, uh, that there's um, possibilities for uh, discrimination, also for new types of discrimination-like problems, uh, social sorting, and uh, sometimes uh, these big databases can be used, for instance, to make the poor pay more, so reinforce inequality, etc. So these are the problems. Many people agree with the problems, but um, I'm, that's a bit of a typical for a law professor, I guess. I'm thinking all the time, like, what should we do? But um, I'm very pragmatic. Um, it's not that I always have answers, but that is, um, I quickly get distracted by um, solutionism, perhaps, like, what, sh what should we do? Um, uh, and uh, policy makers are struggling, and that's not so surprising, because also uh, legal scholars are struggling. <laughs> Um, I think there's I've plenty to criticize, but I think the GDPR is, a, under the conditions, is a pretty noble and pretty good try. And that aims for, reg it's the general data protection regulation, and it's full, of th it's full of holes, and I continue to write papers on that, but that is also a bit typical for legal scholars. If policymakers do their work really well, then we tend not to write papers about it. Um, uh, but it's full of sensible rules, uh, clearly necessary, but also clearly not sufficient. Um, but starting for the next 15 years, I think we're uh, a good short-term approach is um, enforcing the GDPR before we update it again. Then, and that is more on the collection of data and on what big companies um, because we're mostly discussing private sector today, it seems, what big companies or any companies can do with data. Um, then there's another branch of law, um, non-discrimination law, roughly, and it's... Uh, I'm going to do it. Like <laughs> um, uh, and also consumer law, but we, we can invoke those fields of law when data are used to treat people badly. Um, we need better enforcement there, and probably also tweaks and updates. And then there's a field of law which, well, I shouldn't uh, insult lawyers working in that field, but there's an, uh, a field of law that looks very relevant, but uh, namely competition law, but it has allowed uh, companies to become as big as countries. Um, it is partly because 
uh, the general public and privacy and discrimination lawyers that we hope that competition law will solve stuff for us that competition law lawyers themselves think that's not really our job. Um, uh, the general public and me, I'm just scared for uh, companies that are as big as countries. But competition law has traditionally a much narrower focus, namely ensuring that people don't pay uh, more higher prices than reasonably than is reasonable, which also very useful, but that is not um, what many people are thinking of when they see incredibly powerful platforms. Um, but uh, competition uh, economic theory is picking up, and competition was behind economic theory, also seems to be picking up. Um, apart from that, I think we probably also need completely new laws for sector-specific rules, because some problems are the same everywhere, like complexity, etc. But some problems are like typical for each sector. For instance, in the insurance sector, um, data trigger completely different questions than in predictive policing, for instance. Because in predictive policing, or when you're hunting, or when certain state bodies are hunting for terrorists, then it's uh, really bad if um, uh, when there's too many false positives or false negatives. You don't want the same people being picked out the line on the airport every time again because the computer thinks that they are probably terrorists. That's horrible. Um, but uh, in another sector, one of the most successful um, from an economic perspective uh, sectors, targeted advertising, with, uh, which is data-driven, has many problems with that. But false positives is probably not the main problem. Google is always targets me with um, uh, ads for shampoo. <laughs> it, it, it is not the problem here. I have problems with the surveillance. But, um, therefore, I think that for new laws, and I think we need them, we need to look at sector by sector. I think of way of uh, thank you. Well, thank you to all three respondents for very interesting responses. Um, I'll try and be brief. Three minutes. <laughs> I don't think I, it's too hard, but uh, I'll, let me have a go. So Yannicka's points um, uh, about the limits of the usefulness of this, so of course, I, I understand that. Uh, we're trying to reframe our understanding of what's going on here today. So that doesn't necessarily mean this will be practically useful immediately in the courts of law, obviously. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, things are, I would argue, a little more complicated than you hinted because under colonialism we had very strange entities like the East India Company, which was a quasi-state in India but was a company technically and in a close relation to the British state. And one of the key things that I think law, whether it wants to or not, has to deal with today is that, as you said, corporations are massively powerful and in a particular way they have greater access to data and to knowledge than states themselves now have. So there's a new asymmetry between corporations and states which the law is going to have to start to deal with which is completely new uh, and therefore we can't just use precedents for the past to grapple with that. Um, whether exploitation, I'm not sure that will help, but I think we need to think about the changing our social order, if you like, and see what legal tools we need for that. So that will be my response, but it's obviously a very valid point. Um, Kern made some very eloquent points about um, colonialism. Um, there's so many things I could say. Just quickly, first of all, we're not saying, of course, that old colonialism has died. Of course, it continues in a weaker form. Uh, some of what Facebook does is neo-colonial, without question. Um, secondly, although it wasn't so much in the talk, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on, in the book on how people are affected in very different ways by this general transformation. So, if you're already in a weak position, you're going to likely to be weaker as a result of it. And there are particular populations now being targeted, above all migrants and so on. So, the force of the new order is overlaid on the landscape, very unequal, inherited from the previous order. So, there will be these resonances, that's guaranteed. Uh, and you can look at that, for example, in the, shot, in the workplace. So workers who've been weakened for 20, 30 years now have almost no ability to resist surveillance in the workplace if they're at lower levels of the organization. And that's a fundamental issue that needs to be think about when we think about the legal remedies. It may affect people like Jeff Bezos less, 
corporate surveillance of the workplace, but his employers I am concerned about. So we do have to be very attentive to these issues of inequality. Um, and also the deeper point you made about denigration. Now that's a more difficult one. Um, we're not saying, I think it would be premature to say that the sorts of full-blown human hierarchy that emerged over two centuries with colonialism is going to emerge in the next five years. I think it would be surprising if it did. It's going to take a long time for that form of differentiation to emerge. We maybe already begin to see the signs of it in terms of those who are profoundly excluded. Uh, black single mothers in the United States have close to zero chances of negotiating the terms of their data. Pretty well zero. People in different positions may have a chance, it may be negotiable. There will be fundamentally excluded populations which will stabilise and on those basis new hierarchies may emerge. We just don't know, it's too early yet. But what we're saying is let's not rule out that possibility, i.e. let's not rule out the possibility of thinking about this as a long-term colonial shift just because it's in the early stages and therefore not fully formed. Uh, moving on, bearing in mind time, Frederick's points. Well. It's very interesting to look at the limits of, of, of law today, particularly competition law, which Orla Linsky, my comment, uh, co colleague at LSE, has written really well about how its closeness to economic reason is a really deep problem for, uh, for competition law. Um, I do have a few suggestions, being practical. Um, I, I think that law needs to think, or civil society needs, whether there are certain things that should just be made illegal. Are there certain types of tracking, i.e. putting something inside your body, that it is just wrong for a human being to do to another or pretend they have consent to? Just period. It's, it offends human dignity. Maybe we should be really clear about things which just are wrong. Um, secondly, um, I think we need to think about how this all plays out in the case of inequality, the workplace. Work relations are now profoundly changed by the fact that the employer is tracking you at all times and accessing your social media data too. Is this satisfactory? Does it damage workers' rights in a fundamental way that we should be protesting and needing new worker protection to think about the consequences of uh, surveillance? And thirdly, whether we need to introduce, and there have been suggestions of this in uh, US sociology and uh, also Julie Cohen has generated this, the principle of seemfulness. I don't know how that would translate into European law, but the basic idea, if, if data collection is about no resistance, collecting everything, and that is an ideology, then the idea of saying no, data should be always only used for the purpose for which it is gathered unless there is specific and explicit and lasting and meaningful consent. That, for me, will be a positive principle. The GDPR, of course, tries to go in that direction but it doesn't go far enough and one weakness is that it tends to defer to the legitimate commercial or other objectives of the organization let's say a school that collects data but if schools increasingly become defined around the collection of data to monitor students as they already being then how is GDPR going to be used to challenge what they do in the normal course of their business it just won't work we need stronger principles than that. Great initiative though it was, of course. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the And we, you can use the microphone. I would now like to invite questions. Please, raise your hand if you have any question of Kelly. And I hope they're ready. Please, will you stand up and introduce yourself before we ask your question? Uh, Hi, uh, I'm Oscar. Uh, I did theatre studies, so this is a bit of a different field for me. Um, you seem to make a very uh, ethically human-centered uh, train of thought. And I was wondering, when you said data justice can be seen as cognitive justice, also in the way we connect that to a colonial viewpoints, how would you respond to the idea of like a spiritual justice? If we take the idea of belief into account, when we discuss knowledge. Okay. Nick, and I would like to invite the three of you to yes. if you have any responses. Yes, but I worry we're not going to hear the questions on the recording. I mean, is it possible? Is there a microphone? Oh, you can hear it. Okay, good. You can hear it. And, and I need to use, use this, this again. Okay, just, just put it. Um, well, the qu you're right. The, the question of cognitive justice opens a lot of big 
questions because it is justice at the most fundamental level in how human beings think about what the world is and what it can be and who controls those narratives. There's no deeper form in the end of injustice than that because it is partly in terms of their understandings of the world that people are able to cope with great pain, certain degrees of violence within limits and so on. So it is very important. Spiritual justice, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. I mean, you mean justice in relation to religion? Yes, but also justice in the way you are allowed to um, conduct your spiritual life. Ah, okay, thank you. Well, I, I myself don't have any religion, but my co-author does. He's a Muslim. So um, we haven't foregrounded this in the book, uh, but I think we assume and hope that there is some spaces of religious experience for him which are so far immune from tracking. I know there are apps being used in religious domains. There are in every domain. Um, uh, and it's, of course, fundamentally important to uh, hold on to that. But it, you do raise a fundamental point because um, you could argue against everything I was saying on freedom and autonomy. And that was a very condensed bit of the talk, which is a little bit more legal, but it wasn't the theme of this talk, um, that God has always watched over us. In the Christian conception and in the Muslim conception, the Islamic conception, that God is always watching. And there was there have been books written about this quite recently, in fact, in theology. But when you think about it, the idea of Christian conscience, and I speak, as I say, as an atheist, but the idea of Christian conscience, as far as I understand, literally makes no sense if there is no struggle, if there is no movement that the soul makes from its state of making a profound error to getting it right and seeing things. Yes, God is in some transcendental sense aware of the struggle or becomes aware of it. But the idea that there's not a space, which is the space of the self, in which that struggle occurs, which no other force, except maybe God, can interfere with, that is fundamental to the very meaning of Christianity, at least as in Protestant forms, and maybe all. So we are arguing that quite a fundamental thing is being disturbed here when marketers tell us, and I'm quoting a marketer here, Trisata Inc. from the United States, that they know us better than we know ourselves. This is a marketing cliche. We just accept it. We must not accept that. You know the new motto of the NSA? How that is? In God no. we trust, the rest we monitor. Huh. <laughs> There you are. And maybe God's databases are not little need updating too. <laughs> Any other questions that I can invite? Please. Can you stand up and say your name? Yes. I'm Elisabeth Kuyper. Hi, Nick. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for um, a, a very thought provoking because I have so many questions. I try to be quick <laughs> and maybe we'll save the list for later. Uh, so the thing that struck me in your sort of list of, you know, the, the the differences in the parallels between the old colonialism and the new ones are there are two things that I was wondering that didn't, that I thought might also be there. Uh, so one is one is the political as as a realm because of course what colonialism did was not only develop new forms of organizations, so national organizations and markets, but also the nation states. And I think increasingly people say, and I think this also came through to both well, certainly both the people scholars. So the nation states, so that is also maybe that we're looking at a new political institutions or new political forms emerging yeah. with this person, because I think that would sort of be the, the hypothesis yeah. from this parallel. Yeah, yeah. And secondly, another hypothesis following the same train of thought is also the, the emergence of new subjectivity. So if you follow, sort of follow the steps of the line, as you go from new configurations to new, uh, to in the end, to new subjectivities, if you say. And then the third is just a question. Uh, and I know this is big, but maybe you do. The third is, why do you still call it capitalism? Do you think it will remain capitalism? Uh. Do you think it will be capitalism? It is, or will remain, or will it be something new for which we need to new name? Wow. And on Sorry. the question of nation state, I would also like yes, to please, uh, I don't want question to, uh, Should I start? Please okay. Please. Um, well, those are really great points. I mean, I think this new subjectivities 
I mean, there is plenty of evidence already um, that data collection, particularly around apps and, and sorry, um, Fitbit and those, so it's being normalized by many. And the quantified self is an attempt to craft a new form of self. I think it's utterly contradictory and in bad faith. It's utterly dishonest um, because, and often a lot of the empirical work on people who do use the quantified stuff finds that the people break down. They can't go on. They can't work out are they getting closer to themselves or further away. They feel deeply troubled by interfering with the space where they thought they once were. So the empirical evidence is very ambiguous. So subjectivity is an urgent area for empirical research. Uh, it's, gonna, it's developing, it's, but it's not as clear as we might think according to the rhetoricians. On um, the political, that's a really great point. I mean, we, although our book is very broad in its framing, <laughs> extreme, terrifying for us as writers, on the other hand, we try and avoid areas that, that have to, must be complete speculation at this point. So. Our argument is, this is what we see marketers, capitalists saying at the moment. And let's just project it into the future and assume it happens. That's all the only assumption we make. Of course, it will not happen exactly as they, but we have to take that seriously as their goal. There are other areas which require fundamental new transformations which haven't happened yet, such as in new legal developments, and maybe in the form of the state and the relation between state and corporations, that it's impossible to predict because they're non-linear developments. We don't know where they're going to go. But where you're going is very interesting, that if the main sources, leaving aside Facebook's current problems, the main sources of legitimacy become not just brands, but platforms which curate the spaces where we are, and states are always catching up with their legitimacy, then there is obviously a much deeper problem for the legitimacy of law. And I know people like Murray Hildebrandt and Julie Cohen, they're writing exactly on that. Uh, and that is obviously a problem for the, the state itself as a site of rational governing. So I think the very notion of governance is at stake here. And then when, Mark face, when Mark Zuckerberg was speaking in February 17, before the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, and Trump was just elected, he spoke as if he was the President of the United States, that famous statement on February 16, 2017. He spoke to the world community with very clear knowledge of what he was doing, that people did not want to hear the actual President of the United States. So these are very, very uncharted waters. Why call it capitalism? Um, well, capitalism is a big thing, and there's no sign it's running out of steam. On, on the contrary, we're arguing it's gaining new fuel now. Um, we, uh, as far as we go, so we don't go as far as Shoshana Zuboff in her book and say, here's the new capitalism, it involves surveillance, even though what she says is in detail correct, we, or partially correct, but we argue this is potentially a new mode of production involving data and labor whose full form will take 20, 30 years to stabilize, so it will be foolish to predict it yet. Yes, we'll still call it capitalism for now, but whether we'll need a new name in 30 years' time, that's our disagreement with Zuboff. It's too early to say whether surveillance is the key thing. On that note, Of the state <coughs> yeah, yeah, it's very companies. interesting. Uh, which I think another part of the question you raised is um, the issue you raised is that oftentimes what we see in uh, platform uh, capitalism is the issue of uh, public partner private public private partnerships, and you mentioned the VOC, which really raises the issue: what about those public private partnerships? What is what kind of entity are they in this debate, and can they actually? be legal actors in this whole field of which is very contentious. Could you please yeah. reflect on that, John? Um, well, I think the word that nicely captures this is complexity, as you <laughs> explain it. But um, of course, we can see in, 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 in legal developments this um, extraordinary um, hybridization, in a way, between the public and the private sphere, between the state and, and private actors. So um, this is a very classic uh, bifurcation that we, we have known for a very long time, but find it increasingly difficult to deal with. Uh, what we also can see is that 
um, at least legal scholars try to find new concepts that um, that could help us to to deal with this uh, new very hybrid complex situation notions such as legal pluralism sometimes can play a role um, so that we accept that um, I mean well legal uh, the field of law is, is, is used to thinking in, in very simple terms so you need some kind of a, um, a hierarchy you need someone to have the, the final say to set the rules to enforce them to to, um, um, to solve a conflict. Um, and of course, you will still need that also in this um, new reality. But sometimes we have to accept that um, at a certain point, there can be different legal realities existing at the same time. So that might be one way of solving it. But for lawyers, that's not really satisfactory. Um, so what we should try to do in a way is to, um, um, well, to, to find a solution to this final say issue. Uh, but in a way, and I think, well, that's the, the current um, doctrine, at least, it's, it should always turn back to the nation state in the end, or to at least an international player who has obtained some kind of, um, well, uh, competence to deal with certain conflicts or to set rules in a certain way. And then we, we do have an agreement between states and between private parties and states that they will adhere to that and that they will um, allow a certain international body or a public-privately relationship to, um, uh, well, to, to intermediate between two conflicting uh, parties in a certain uh, approach. So we, and I think that's we, we need different types of agreements, um, but and, and, and different uh, power structures and power relationships, um, and to uh, but still and that's from a legal perspective that's very important uh, to make sure that these important rule of law values that we try to guarantee within nation states, um, so separation of powers, um, uh, voice, uh, participation, accountability, uh, respect for fundamental rights, respect for human dignity and personal autonomy can still be guaranteed. Um, and that's going to be extremely difficult because those values are not adhered to worldwide. Um, so in fact, as an answer to your question, I can only say that, well, international law seems to be, well, at least part of the answer, and that could be public-private kind of uh, uh, law made, um, if there is acceptance of that between those different part, uh, <coughs> uh, parties. Um, but we're just only at the very beginning of, of developing these new notions and adapting to this new reality that we're finding ourselves in. Uh, thank you. I think one of the, the chilling points, of course, is that legal pluralism is one of the big problems of colonial systems, right? So the problem with colonial systems is that they have different sorts of subjects. Yes, yeah, so and sometimes it's also the solution to that. I mean, if you do have an occupier um, in a state um, having its own uh, rules and different sets of values, and you still have a population living there with their own set of rules and, and values. Um, I, mean, I mean that colonial systems traditionally have different sets of legal systems. They didn't have a disability yeah. and the, the others. Yeah. So I don't want this to be a discussion between the two of you. You can have some time after, you know, afterwards at the reception. Are there any other questions? We have time for one or two more questions. Paddy and then... Should we take them all together and then I'll try Sure, we can do that. Paddy and then Ego. Yeah, simultaneously. No, no, no. That. Oh, In sequence. Sorry. I want okay. to build on, on Janke's uh, first comments there. You know, um, for me, the ideas of extraction and appropriation uh, sprung out as well. They seem very central to the kind of comparison you're drawing between previous and the current colonial projects as you see them. Yeah. What they're both doing is a sort of extraction, appropriation of a resource. Uh, and the resource back then was, you know, land, raw materials, and now it's data. But I think something rubs there for me is someone who studied, for example, copyright. Uh, the idea that, you know, when you copy a film, you're not uh, stealing from someone, right? There's something very different about the way information or data works and actual physical property. And this is also why intellectual property is so problematic to think about sometimes, because information is non rivalist I'm not, in fact, making someone poorer by observing, by copying, by creating information about it. So that, I think, presents some challenges to the kind of analogy you're trying to draw in terms of extracting or appropriating data from people. And in that sense, I might be less optimistic than Yannick is about using that concept. To me, it sounds, you know, it has echoes of Warner Brothers are universal and they lobby for copyright. 
they're stealing this information from me. The can information be so. Okay, and let's take Echo's question and then answer both. Thank you. Uh, I guess my question is a follow up to your earlier discussion uh, at the table, uh, which is, I guess, about agency. And you have done a lot of work about agency uh, before. Yes. Uh, in in this analysis of, of this totalitarian system of uh, identification, uh, the question is where's agency? And, and, and you seem uh, to to see it in the field of law, um, given the importance of lawyers at the table, but also ending your talk with reflections on on, on law. But in a uh, perspective on capitalism, uh, law uh, is part of, I mean you have called it Marx and Nobel, and like law is an institution within society uh, that legitimizes uh, capitalism and probably has uh, legitimized colonialism. So why would you think that this is an institution that has agency and what about uh, other um, intermediary institutions uh, that might have agency or should develop an agency in that, uh, particularly thinking of uh, all the intellectual work and in, uh, creating mm -hmm. apps, software, building platforms, and so the data intermediaries. Yeah. Both are very profound questions. Uh, I don't expect like an exhaustive answer, but all right. you can give us a hint. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> well, Let's uh, start with Paddy's first question. That's a very good question. Um, so um, I wasn't putting the emphasis so much on a notion of exploitation. I believe there is exploitation, or at least that's a way in loose terms to talk about what's going on. Extraction, on the other hand, I, I think is something is being extracted. The potential for value is being extracted from a domain which overlays the domain where human beings are. I think it's very problematic, and this is part of what you're pointing to, to say that what's being taken is something personal. That exactly, because of course, um, when um, um, a fridge in my house um, passes on information that maybe I've been acting a little erratically and uh, drinking milk at, uh, or strange times in the middle of the night, or at least not typically. And then that is used with other data that is nothing to do with that fridge to say, well, possibly Nick's suffering some mental imbalance. He's been very nervous since he got back from Utrecht. He's very unhappy since he's left Utrecht, and so on. And then my insurers start worrying about my premiums and so on, connecting them with my age and so on. Now, that, where is the personal information in that? That's obviously much more complicated. So this is a problem that many lawyers have pointed to, that privacy, at least as traditionally conceived, is a very blunt weapon to get at this. That's why uh, we don't you rely on that in Chapter 5 of the book. We move back from that and try and identify, at the fundamental ethical level, what is being troubled, which is the space of the self, as I hinted at. The space where we are alongside ourselves, where human beings need to be free to do what they do. Otherwise, they are not selves at all. Now, how you then translate back to legal interventions is obviously very complicated. It may be through human rights law. It may be through versions of the German constitution, the Grundgesetz, which has the principle of the right to the free development of the personality which I've always assumed lay was one of the um, um, rich philosophical sources of the GDPR, but it's not in the GDPR exactly. Nothing quite that strong. Um, GDPR doesn't quite go so strongly as condemning any collection. It says it raises issues of human rights, but then it goes on to move past them, which you know, I, I think is one of the weaknesses of the GDPR. So I, I, you agree, exploitation, that's, that's a weak area. The more problem, better way of looking at it is in terms of what happens to the human subject. Um, it, this is not really about information, the key thing. The key is about the status of the human self and its right to freedom. Um, that's the way I would answer your very good question. Um, the other thing I would say, and this leaking to what Ego says, there's no reason why we have to follow what Schmidt says happened in the early 16th century and really did happen, which was that the Spanish court gradually worked out a legal justification for colonialism. It took them 20, 30 years to work it out. At first they thought it was unjustified because these people were potential Christians and you couldn't just take their gold. 
how could they be saved? It was theirs. They were potential human beings of the right sort. They had to evolve the idea they were not human beings, and that was a crucial part of that, as Kern was alluding to, and that took time. There was an, ev there was an ev evolution, so there's no re we can avoid what happened in Schmidt's diagnosis. We can avoid this if we resist this, but we have to resist it because we are moving down in that direction. So in terms of what Ego said, where do I, and well, I forgot to answer what Kern did, where is resistance? Well, chapter six of the book is about resistance and thinking about that. Um, because our diagnosis is so broad, we don't have any simple toolkit for how to change this. That would be a ridiculous to pretend to do that. Instead, we uh, argue against the idea that partial solutions are solutions. Because if this is a social order where everything is connected in the way Elias said, you can't take out one bit and change the order. It, the order will reproduce itself. So you need the most important critical tool is imagination, is reimagining a different future, remembering the past, which was different from this, as you pointed out in one of your books. Only 10 years ago, we were acting differently. It was a very important sentence for me. Of course we were. We can remember things were different, but that has to be turned into an imagination of the future. And then it becomes a matter of civil society, not by no means just legal institutions, because the theme today was, uh, because of our response, was going to be a little bit about the law. I angled it that way, but that um, normally most of the book is not about law at all. It's about civil society, resistance, and solidarity, for which the, lean, the law is potentially a means, but normally uh, it operates in other ways. So we have to build solidarity first before we have the right sort of law. And that's going to be a very long struggle, I think. Well, these sound like very famous last words. <laughs> Any three of you would like to respond to anything that Nick said? Or? OK. I would like to thank all four of you, and especially, of course, Nick Coldry, who uh, uh, I would like to thank once again with a big applause. And <laughs> Thank you.